This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Mosaic, a daily news program from Link TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. Germany's federal prosecutor said that the three suspects who were detained in connection with a plot to launch attacks in Germany had a plan to target American installations in the country. The prosecutor's office added that the three suspects belonged to what it described as an Islamic terrorist organization. Germany's defense minister said that the German authority has arrested three suspects accused of plotting to carry out bomb attacks on Frankfurt airport and the U.S. military base in Rammstein. The German capital is witnessing a growing security concern. This news comes after a plot was uncovered to blow up the nation's main airport. Frankfurt Airport is an important European hub, which receives more than 50 million travelers a year. According to preliminary reports, three men were arrested in connection with a plot to blow up Frankfurt Airport using a booby-trapped car. In a in a joint security operation, the German police and intelligence, as well as other law enforcement agencies, were able to foil a large-scale terrorist plot in the country. We have monitored the suspects' activities and uncovered and foiled their plan. According to German sources, one of the suspects is a Turkish national. The other two are German citizens who converted to Islam, and all three belong to a jihadist group. The source added that the suspect had a plan to carry out attacks on U.S. targets, including the Ramstein Air Base near Frankfurt Airport. More than 30,000 U.S. military personnel are currently stationed at Ramstein. Many Germans are opposed to the presence of U.S. military bases. The U.S. President George Bush sends weapons to areas of conflict around the world. This policy serves only Bush's financial interests. The German public expresses a growing fear that a terrorist threat has become eminent in their country. According to public polls, more than 70 percent of Germans fear that a terrorist attack will be launched in the country. This is an increase of 35 percent from previous polls just a few weeks ago, which many believe has to do with new developments in the internet national arena. I personally feel safe. However, the launch of the terrorist attacks is still a possibility as long as our troops are still stationed in the areas of conflict. The investigation is still at the preliminary phase. However, Germany has realized that the waves of terror no longer distinguish between French, British or German shores. Akram Suleiman, Al Jazeera, Berlin. Ramadi, Iraq, which is currently under the control of the Iraqi and American forces, has witnessed a major change in its neighborhoods, especially its three main streets. These streets now have different names from the ones they were originally known for. More details with Majid Hamid. Life has changed in the city of Ramadi, which lies on the banks of the Euphrates River, especially on its three main streets. Since 2003, the names of these streets no longer retain their meaning as a result of the military operations that took place between the American forces and armed groups. The famed Cinema Street, which is known for its restaurants that offer delicious traditional Iraqi foods, was abandoned by its loyal customers as restaurants closed their doors after the U.S. forces erected cement barriers at its entrances. Even the famous restaurants like the Fallujah restaurant, the Erbil restaurant, and Al Mosul restaurant have been abandoned. We pray to God and hope that the government will reopen the street for us and with time life will return to normal. 
God willing. The doctor's street is the only street that witnesses normal activity, unlike other streets, because it's the only passageway that links to Ramadi through one crossing point. In addition, the U.S. forces have allowed citizens to go from one side to the other. However, the street's name no longer applies, since only a few doctors remain here. Some people want to go to their store on the main street in order to remove their goods and products that were left behind, but they are unable to reach them. As you can see, the street is active and stable. Citizens are walking around, the stores are open, there are police stations and there are police services. The only thing is that these barriers block road traffic. However, citizens can still pass through on their bicycles. The situation of the Orizdi Market Street is no better than the others. It lacks most of its shoppers due to security measures taking place on the periphery. Being located near a security base is a curse on its business owners rather than a blessing, contrary to what the government claims. From Ramadi in western Iraq, Majid Hamid, Al Arabiya. Local citizens said they were pleased with the transfer of control of the presidential palaces in Basra from the multinational forces to the Iraqi government. They said that this transfer shows that the multinational forces have confidence in the capabilities of the Iraqi forces, which are now ready to take over the security responsibilities in all of Iraq. The Iraqi security forces took over the responsibilities of protecting the presidential palaces from the multinational forces until further notice. We hope that the local population cooperates for the sake of protecting these palaces until the prime minister decides what to do with them. As an army, we are only responsible for maintaining security in these palaces. We have nothing to do with what the palaces will be used for. The citizens who live near these presidential palaces said that they were pleased to see the Iraqi forces in control of them. Honestly, all of us are happy because the British forces left the presidential palaces. God willing, we will help the Iraqi forces maintain security in the area. I think that the transfer of power over the presidential palaces from the British to the Iraqi forces is a great step, and God willing, it will help in establishing security. We need such steps in the current time. The multinational forces have returned the presidential palaces to the Iraqi government as a first step towards the transfer of security responsibilities in all of Iraq to the Iraqi government. The headquarters of the presidential palaces in Basra is the third site that was returned to the Iraqi security forces within the past two months. This step paves the way for the transfer of security authorities in all of Iraq from the multinational forces to the Iraqi security forces. Ali al-Sari, al-Iraqiya, al-Basra. The search for fugitive Fatah Islam militants continued today. Lebanese troops were scouring the devastated Palestinian refugee camp of Nahr al-Barid in search for explosives and any surviving members of Fatah Islam. Sporadic gunshots could be heard inside the bound out camp as troops tried to smoke out remaining militants. Here's the story. Lebanese soldiers today continued to hunt for Fatah Islam fugitive fighters after crushing their Islamist militia in fierce gun battles that ended a 15-week standoff. Troops were clearing up the devastated Palestinian refugee camp of Nahr al-Barid in northern Lebanon from explosives and any surviving members of Fatah al-Islam. Sporadic gunshots could be heard inside the bombed-out camp as troops tried to smoke out remaining militants, also calming valleys and hills around neighboring villages for fugitives. Several explosions were also heard during the night and early Wednesday as troops blew up buildings and underground shelters booby-trapped by the Islamist militiamen.
According to AFP, the army found the bodies of six militants on Tuesday and arrested one wounded. Sources said there were more than 40 bodies in one of the hideouts, while the Lebanese Red Cross and the Civil Defense Service retrieved more than 19 bodies. Also on Tuesday, a Tunisian member of Fatah al-Islam was captured in Tripoli, south of the refugee camp. Bashir al-Ermani was caught in an abandoned building in a popular area of Tripoli known as Kubbe. He told interrogators that he had fled Nahr al-Badid on Sunday, traveling on foot through a mountainous area. Source said the man who had a wound to his face also told authorities that he had an accomplice who fled with him. He said the pair split after fleeing Nahr al-Badid some 20 kilometers north of Tripoli. The ongoing crisis between the Muslim Brotherhood and the authorities in Egypt has climaxed with the recent arrest of the group's prominent figures. From Cairo, this report by our colleague Muna Ashmawi. Recently, 16 leaders of the Muslim Brotherhood, including Dr. Isam al Aryan and two members of the parliament were arrested and then released. These events came as the Brotherhood is trying to present their political platform and inaugurate their new headquarters. This crisis comes as a result of the government's failure to administer the affairs of the country. Now, after 26 years of President Hosni Mubarak's rule and the government's holding on to its old infrastructure and spending billions of Egyptian pounds on it, there are entire villages that do not have potable drinking water. The entire public wastes a quarter of its time on a daily basis in order to obtain just one loaf of bread. This has become a bad situation. This is due to the terrible infrastructure that exists, resulting in the suffering of the Egyptian people. The Brotherhood's activities in the streets, its presence and its garnering the support of the Egyptian public has resulted in a rivalry between the government, the majority national party and the Muslim Brotherhood. Many observers, mainly Dr. Abu Ayla Moudi, who broke with the Brotherhood and who is now the head of the center party, say that the lack of response by the Brotherhood on many complicated issues relating to its position on the cops, women and taxes has been met by the government's insistence on ruling indefinitely unchallenged by any party or front, no matter how powerful. The Brotherhood wants the freedom to work, to move, to spread legally and obtain all these rights. From a legal perspective, this right belongs to any group. However, there are responsibilities that go along with these rights. These responsibilities are never mentioned by the Brotherhood. The other side, the state or the authority, says that the Brotherhood breaks the law just by existing. This is also partially true. The Brotherhood is an illegitimate organization. However, the government does not answer other questions. Are they prepared to grant to those who abide by the law the legal right to exist or not? They hide this part of the truth. The people in control of the government want the sole authority for eternity, and they want to monopolize power and resources to use forever. The Brotherhood insists that the reason behind the arrests is to distract from the problem of corruption and public opinion issues in Egypt. The National Party believes the Brotherhood is breaking the law by holding secret meetings between its leaders and members. The Brotherhood says that Islam is the solution. Does the National Party say that Islam is not the solution? Will the National Party abandon this issue? Will they say that Christian brothers or Christianity is the solution? Or will communism or socialism be the solution? These are just slogans. But in reality, what the Brotherhood has asked for is to amend the Constitution for a political program that does not rely on any religious doctrine or slogans that have religious affiliation. The Brotherhood is faced with two options, freedom and democracy that calls for rights, or jails filled with prisoners. Meanwhile, four Brotherhood members are awaiting military trials. Eighty years of conflict between the government and the Muslim Brotherhood climaxed when the Brotherhood became a strong challenger to the National Party. Wide-scale arrests and military trials have been met with the Brotherhood's insistence to bring their political program to the fore. Munash Maui, New TV, Cairo.
أعرب النائب الأول للرئيس الوزراء الإسرائيلي حيم رامون Israel's vice premier حيم رامون called for the halt of electricity, water and fuel supplies to the Gaza Strip if the Palestinians continue to launch rockets into Israel. Meanwhile, Khaled al-Butish, an Islamic Jihad leader, downplayed the latest threats in which Israel vowed to carry out an assault on the Gaza Strip in retaliation for the rocket attacks on the Jewish settlement of Sedrot. Al-Butish added that Israel has never stopped its military escalation. Israel's security cabinet will meet on Wednesday to discuss the course of action the government needs to take in order to stop the launch of the Qassam rockets from the Gaza Strip. The latest round of missile attacks was launched into the heart of Sidrot, where schools were cancelled for the day. According to knowledgeable sources, it is a matter of time before Israel launches a wide-scale offensive or escalates its military campaign in the Gaza Strip. This news comes after several Israeli officials, including Ehud Olmert, talked about an imminent assault on the Gaza Strip. We have so far taken limited security measures. We must admit that such limited measures haven't solved the problem. Our patience is running thin. We must carry out a wide-scale offensive aimed at stopping the launch of cross-border rockets. We must strike the rocket launchers and their leaders and those who support them financially. We must intensify the war on terror. With the exception of some Israeli leaders from the far left, most political blocs in Israel support a military escalation at this time in the Gaza Strip, while some Israeli leaders, including Israel's Vice Premier Chaim Ramon, proposed cutting off electricity, water and fuel supplies to the Gaza Strip. Others proposed targeting Palestinian political and military leaders. Although the military option has enjoyed the support of the majority in Israel, a few have criticized it. Before launching an offensive, we should try to find a third party to help us reach a ceasefire agreement with the Palestinians. There appear to be no fruitful negotiations between Israel and Hamas, especially since the latter doesn't recognize Israel's right to exist. Regardless of the course of action taken by Israel's security cabinet, the outcome will likely overshadow the situation in those areas that are within the range of the Qassam rockets. After Israel isolated the West Bank from the Gaza Strip, the latter has become an easier target for Israel. There is a difference between the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. The Gaza Strip is run by the ousted government of Ismail Haniya, which does not recognize Israel. However, the Palestinian government of Salam Fayyad in the West Bank accepts the quartet resolutions. What is more important to Israel and its security cabinet is not the course of action it takes, but the reaction it may create at the national and international levels. This news has raised many questions about the political path that the government of Ehud Olmert may take in the near future. For Madar program, Shireen Yunus, Abu Dhabi Channel, West Jerusalem. The town of Bilin, west of Ramallah, has been under the spotlight for the past three years. The town fought hard against Israel's apartheid wall, which continues to claim the West Bank's land one inch at a time. Bilin finally reaped what its residents have sown. This news comes after Israel's High Court of Justice ordered the government to reroute a section of the separation wall that has split the town from its farmland. Meanwhile, the residents expressed hope that they will be allowed to return to their confiscated land. Mani Abu Hantash reports from the town of Bilin, west of Ramallah. This is how the residents of Berlin celebrated after reclaiming part of their confiscated land. This news was the outcome of three years of diligent perseverance and determination. It also comes after Israel's High Court of Justice ordered the government to reroute a section of the separation wall around the town of Berlin, which has become a symbol of resistance against the barrier. We were able to reclaim 1,100 dunams of our land in Berlin. Another 1,200 dunams are still confiscated. The court decision was a victory. It's true, it was a partial victory, but it was a large one for the residents of Berlin.
who showed a great deal of heroism and perseverance. The residents celebrated the victory in their own way. Thank God civil disobedience is the best thing to do. Thank God we took back our land. What's important is that we took back our land in Bilin and we were able to remove this apartheid wall. Some residents were not as lucky, but this did not stop them from taking part in today's celebration. Amidst this celebration, they vowed to continue the resistance until they get back every inch of their confiscated land. I have mixed feelings of happiness and sadness. My uncle and I have lost more than 60 dunams to the wall. So far, we have not received any part of our land. The residents of Bilin chose this area, overlooking an Israeli fence, to celebrate their victory. This Israeli fence was a place where they have staged their protests during the past three years. It's also in this area where the Israeli army often attacked the residents and foreign sympathizers who came to express solidarity with them. The army tried to silence the residents, but their voice was louder and they were able to demand their rights. Prominent Iraqi religious figure Ayatollah Ali Sistani has renewed his support for the government of Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki, urging the need for disarming the insurgents in the Iraqi holy cities. That came in a meeting between Ayatollah Sistani and a high-ranking delegation led by Nouri al-Maliki. Following the meeting, the Iraqi premier told reporters that the top cleric had, has supported his government's disarmament plan in Iraqi Shiite and Sunni holy cities and has called for full handover of security affairs to the Iraqi police and the army. Maliki added, Ayatollah Sistani has called on the government to render better public services, press ahead with the National Reconciliation Plan and prevent sectarian moves. Hundreds of Australian school students marched in downtown Sydney carrying banners and shouting anti-war and anti-Bush slogans. The protesters are also slammed Australian Premier John Howard for backing George W. Bush and its hawkish plans in the Middle East. Australia has launched the country's biggest ever security operation after anti-war activists announced their plan for a mass weekend protest against Bush's visit to Australia and the Iraq war. Days of intense fighting continues in Afghanistan with two NATO soldiers killed and 75 more rebels reported dead, including in new battles in an area where Taliban sees the group of South Koreans. The NATO said it has also killed one of Taliban leaders involved in hostage-taking and killing of South Korean aid workers. In another incident, Taliban fighters attacked Afghan and foreign soldiers at a checkpoint in the southern province of Helmand. The soldiers said they have managed to kill 25 Taliban militants in the fighting. Also in Helmand, two policemen were killed when a Taliban-style bomb struck their vehicle. Morocco goes to the polls on Friday. Now, all this week, Al Jazeera is looking at the political picture in the country. There are four major parties in the race to rule. The Secular Socialist Union of People's Forces, the Secular Independence Party, the Islamist Party of Justice and Development, or PJD, and the Secular National Rally of Independence. Now, recent opinion polls indicate the PJD will gain the most votes. We travel to the city of Meknas, near Fez, where political hopes are riding on the popularity of the city's mayor. Now, even though the mayor is not contesting Morocco's elections, Hashim Ahalbara reports that he's expected to be a major influence. The mayor of Meknas is the most popular politician in the area. Though he is not himself a candidate, his party is taking advantage of his success to boost its chances in the city. When this wealthy landlord was elected five years ago, there were local fears his Justice and Development Party would impose the Sharia law. 
People thought that we would close down hotels and nightclubs and impose upon the people a strict dress code. Bubakar Bilkora had to win the hearts and minds of a skeptical population and preach the ideals of his party. Any misstep could be costly. McNass provided the Party of Justice and Development with an opportunity to run a city for the first time. But McNass is a city of wines and tourism, and for its mayor with an Islamic reference, the experience was almost like tiptoeing through a minefield. Belkora hopes to make McNass one of Morocco's top destinations for tourists and improve the livelihood of the poor people before his term comes to an end two years from now. A recent suicide bombing attack aimed at tourists is an indication of how hard the challenges he faces truly are. People greet him with mixed reactions. This young voter says he will give his voice to Belkora's party, while this man says the mayor failed him and did nothing for his district. What you saw was normal. We were not given the budget to fix all the problems. We devised a plan for the development of the city, but the government didn't help us. Five years since he took office in McNass, he still faces a lot of resistance from authorities. Now, Belkora is skeptical at how much his party could accomplish should it take part in forming the country's next government. If the PJD do well in these elections and help form the government, it will lose credibility and popularity. In McNess, we are a microcosm of a government, and even here we faced a lot of problems. Belkora has accomplished what no other mayor has ever done in Morocco. He turned the city's large deficit into a surplus. It's for this that he wants to be remembered, even more than his contribution to what could be major gains for his party in these elections. Hashim Al-Barra, Al Jazeera, McNass. Hi. I'm Sandeep Roy. I've been a journalist and radio host for New America Media and a commentator on National Public Radio for more than five years and written for mainstream and ethnic media for more than 10. And I can tell you, it's tough out there for journalists these days, especially for journalists, scholars, and filmmakers dedicated to bringing ignored voices and ideas into the public forum. There are just fewer and fewer outlets. One rare survivor is Mosaic, world news from the Middle East. It gives me the news about the Middle East through its own lens. It's no accident that there is no show like Mosaic on any other channel. A program like Mosaic that takes a truly unflinching look at U.S. foreign policy and the Middle East could only be made possible in a completely uncensored forum like Link TV. That makes it a precious resource and an endangered one. The foundation support that funded Mosaic for the last six years has ended, so I'm asking you to come through for Mosaic right now. Please call the number on your screen now and make that donation for Mosaic. Anything from $50 to $500 will help keep Mosaic on the air and you informed. I want to thank those of you who made that call. Because of you, Link TV and Mosaic are getting closer to their $200,000 goal. But there's a long way to go. The number's right there on your screen, so call now and make that donation, or go online at linktv.org and click on the support button. As a journalist, I know firsthand how rare this kind of channel is. Please call the number on your screen and keep Mosaic alive. Once it's gone, it will not find a home on mainstream media. Call the number on your screen right now, or donate online at linktv.org. Give whatever you can to keep one bastion of free press on the air. Thank you. Mosaic needs your support. Help us reach our goal to raise $200,000 by the end of the year to keep Mosaic on the air. Pledge your gift today at 1-866-485-8848 or linktv.org. Get more news about the Middle East online at linktv.org slash mosaic. The Mosaic webpage offers a complete archive of Mosaic programs, program transcripts, the Mosaic video podcast, and the Mosaic Intelligence Report, a weekly analysis of the hottest stories from the Middle East.
The views expressed on Mosaic are those of the participating broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible with the support of viewers like you. Thank you. This program was brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. television network devoted to global and national news with uncompromising documentaries and diverse cultural programs. Programs which connect you to the world.